What, what did the Lord, our Father, actually mean when he said that? Let me break part of it back to the Hebrew for you. He said to the Elohim. That is to say, God and the angels. That's plural. Okay. Let us make man in our image. The word image, um, I'm going to call from the Septuagint because we're going to go directly to the New Testament, so I want to use the word in the Greek. Image, in the Hebrew, kind of means a phantom one that looks exactly like. But from the Septuagint, we catch the better meaning for the word in the Greek is character. Character for image. And the etymology of it is that it's a die. Okay? Like if you were going to make a penny that you carry in your pocket, you place, this is not the way we do it, but this is the way they did it then. You put the copper there and you strike the die. And it leaves a perfect image. Just like the die. And I think it's important that we take it to that depth. Well, when Christ touches you, uh, I don't like to use the word mark, but the cast is made. He touches you. And when he is in you, then you are in him. And uh, perhaps the machinist could better understand what I'm saying, but the Lord God Almighty uses natural things whereby we can get a better idea overall of the spiritual message he wishes to convey to you. That if Christ is in you and you're in him, that die has, that cast has touched you, and you, it'll change you. You know, I, I know some of you, I know what you used to be and I know what you are today. I like, like the person that I got today instead of the one I had yesterday. I, I really am not thinking about one living soul. <laughs> really. Maybe I'm thinking about myself, okay? But anyway, I guarantee you, you well, anyway. Um, that's, that's what it does to people, all right? But the main thing I want you to capture is the reason God can say Emmanuel, which is being converted to say, translated to say God with us, why Jesus could say, if you have seen the Son, you have seen the Father. Why? It's a perfect cast. A perfect guy. That, I mean, he, he, though he was in the flesh, he looked exactly like a Father of our, our God. That, um, and uh, he, I, I suppose what I want to get to here is to let you know that God will never ask you to do something that he hasn't done himself. You know, a lot of people might say, oh, put this in these old flesh bodies, especially when you get a few miles on it, you know. Why would he do that? Well, he did it himself. You know, he, didn't, he didn't hide something, and he didn't ask you to do something he hadn't done himself. He, he, I'm going to tell you something. As, as an old military person, a good leader will never ask his people to do something he's not willing to show them how. Get in there and do it yourself, okay? This was a long time before we had political correctness, okay? Where people are so sensitive. Oh, dear goodness. Um, you know, discernment and knowing a heart is a beautiful thing without having to go through a bunch of socialists. A psychopathic rhetoric. Okay. I guess you can tell I'm kind of steamed a little bit at certain things that are going on right now. Be ready to say, okay? Back to the message. He, when you see that son, you see the father, and he was here to show us how to do it. This is why it's real easy for me if someone says, well, should I be baptized? Well, was Christ? I mean, that was Emmanuel, God with us. He saw fit to be baptized. So should I be? Well, the answer is pretty positive. I mean, it's easy, isn't it? It's just natural. He showed us the way. Why? Because it was symbolic. Baptism is symbolic of his going into the tomb and you knowing that he rose out of that tomb as you rise out of that water. 
and you are changed because death is defeated, which is to say Satan. Just like that, period. That's what it's about, okay? Anyway, let us make man in our image. Well, who were all these people? I said before we talked a little bit about Jeremiah. God saying in Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 1 through 6, Hey, I knew you before you ever entered your mother's womb. Well, how could he possibly do that? Because he was with God. He was one of the Elohim, okay? Just as you were, as everyone was. Get the little heavy, put it on the shelf, and let it rest there a while, okay? God has servants, and God has children. His whole plan in utilizing his servants is to help his children. I don't care if they're good, bad, ugly, in between, or what. God wants his children helped. So they are made in their image for that purpose, that son, that God could trust because they stood against Satan in the first rebellion. And he knows that they've got the courage and the brass horns to stand up and not be intimidated by words of man, but would live by the word of God. So, therefore, the cast, the die is set. And when the hammer of the Spirit hits it and touches you, you uh, do I want to say you're touched? I don't, I don't, <laughs> you are by the Spirit, but I want to be careful how I feel. That. That's an old term for some of you young people may not know that a guy really, his elevator stops short at the top. You know? Well, I know you're not that way. Okay. But once Christ comes into your life, he, it makes a difference. That's why he said, I, I want you to be a little bit salty. Why salt makes a difference? When, when, you, when you put salt in your um, beans or on your eggs, they taste different. But he expects his yet to make a difference. Not a big difference, but enough that people are drawn to that. Now, having said that, um, it was his order, that was one of the first plans and orders of the day, was to create Elohim. Why? Well, a third of them had chased after Satan and worshipped him. That's scriptural. Okay? Revelation chapter 12. And he didn't want to lose them. He wanted to offer them salvation. That's why, as God's elect, you're duties in serving God are very important because God loves those lost ones. He does. And he certainly didn't send one of his elect down here to be a goody goody two shoes and too good to even talk to a sinner, but to be able to help if the opportunity prevails. Okay? You don't go around forcing yourself on people. You protect your credibility. You, you quite frankly, are such good bait, you draw them to you, okay? Good bait, you don't chunk at the fish, they're drawn to it, okay? And that's a good analogy. If you live your life in the natural, and people see that you handle problems well, they're going to seek you out for advice if they're in trouble. That's just the way it is, and that's the way God utilizes his children in seed planting and simply in life. Open your Bibles to the book of Colossians. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 1. A letter by Paul to the Colossians. And he will be talking about this situation. I think it's appropriate that this being that kind of conception, where things do make a difference, where he makes a difference. Uh, chapter 1 of the great book of Colossians, and that word of wisdom from our Father, let's pick it up with verse 12, and it reads, Giving thanks unto the Father, don't ever forget to do that, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints, in light. Okay. Light is truth. You know, not, not everyone's mind can be opened up whereby the truth can just filter in, whereby they can see and understand and receive that truth 
from both the first earth age, this age, and the one to come. To be able to see it with clarity and in the simplicity, I repeat, simplicity in which Christ taught it. That's important. You um, were teaching Luke. Now, Luke means light giver. Okay. Light dispels darkness in your life. Man only fears the unknown. Well, that'll shake you up in a hurry. But when you look ahead and understand, do your homework, research it, and know what you're going to gain from making that move, that uh, action that goes a little bit into the unknown, and it alleviates, alleviates that factor of the unknown whereby you can either go under, over, around, or through, whichever it takes to, to get it done, okay? But God himself made you fit to be a part of the inheritance. That means, that means that you're in the will of God, and you are to inherit what he has for you, and he owns everything. Uh, verse 13, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son? His dear Son being Emmanuel, God with us. The one we were just speaking of. Um, has delivered us from the power of darkness. Why? You know, a lot of people say, well, I, I still. He delivered us. Listen to me carefully. He delivered us by giving us power over darkness. If you don't use it, then you better get you a strong flashlight. You're going to need it. Okay. But he gives you power over darkness where that die that has hit you, that has cast and has changed you, shines forth that light, reflects the light of Christ, and brings truth into your life. Whereby um, you, utilizing the authority and power that God has given you, order darkness out of your life. Get rid of it. You, you don't have time for it. Who wants to mess with it? Okay? It's just, it's really, uh, when you start messing around with darkness all the time, bad things, negative things in your life, and just, I mean, one right after the other, without simply just putting a stop to it, you may not be the sharper of the brightest nickel on the block. Luke 10, we're going to get there when we're teaching Luke 10, chapter 10. Jesus gives us power and authority over all our enemies, all darkness. That's great. Stop and think about it. How strong is your faith? And that power, you, I know you've heard me say what that power means. Is it just something that we can just gently, what, whatever strength has to go, because the word in the Greek is dynamite. You heard of dynamite? That's where it comes from. The word dynamite comes from dynamite. And you utilize whatever is necessary to protect your credibility, but to get the job done. Okay. Um, that's why they will say, there, there, goes, there goes a child of God. There goes the child of God. But one, the, the die hit him. The, it was cast. And it reflects. Okay. The power from his dear son. Verse 14. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. Now, i got some bad news for you. I don't know if you all have ever noticed it, but we're all a bunch of sinners. Okay. We're going to forget every once in a while, and we're going to sin. Now, any time a person thinks they've risen above sin totally, you're kidding yourself. You're not a, a realist. That's why that you want to repent and know that he loves you and to straighten it out. Okay. What is sin? Sin is to transgress God's law. Okay. Why, well, is the law bad then? No, the law is good. It keeps us out of trouble. Okay. But we all make mistakes. Okay? Um, and uh, his blood, the reason he came to this earth in the image of his son was to be that sacrifice to show you how that only repentance he would say, child, you're forgiven. I mean, he, 
he wants to forgive people, he doesn't want to zap them, okay? He wants to forgive you. All you have to do, he gets no pleasure whatsoever from sending somebody to hell when that judgment time comes. That's what this is all about, is our Father trying to avoid that. Oh, it'll happen, there'll be some go. But he, it's still, besides the fact, he doesn't get any pleasure from it. Verse 15. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? And again, who is the image of the invisible God? In the dimension you're in now, you can't see God. He would be invisible to you. But Christ, that word image there, character. You know, it comes out an English word, basically. It's the character that is on the cast that you're going to strike the coin with, okay? And it makes the character. Okay, we're, we're playing with where the English word came from, but we're speaking Greek here, okay? Why? Because that's what the manuscripts are, and we want to know what he said. He's the exact, when that guy was cast and hit him, he looked exactly as the invisible God, as God came to this dimension, which he can very easily do. When he comes to this dimension, but what did he do? He sent his son. Whereby he's showing us, you know, if he was Emmanuel God with us and it was Christ that died on the cross, don't you see that your father did that for you? If it was God with us, God died on that cross also, fleshly. Showing us how to get it done. Okay. Did it for us. That's a lot of love, friend. A lot of love. Our Father cares about us. You didn't wonder that when you tell him, Father, I love you, it melts his heart. It makes him feel good. And he says, Child, you're going to be all right. I'll take care of you. Use common sense. Use your head. Because he likes to be proud of his children. But then, this son was the firstborn of um, of me, he, he, Christ was with him when the earth was created. Okay, and this is why we're going to go into Melchizedek today, and it's important that you know that Melchizedek was Christ walking the earth. What does Melchizedek mean? And Melchizedek is king in the Hebrew, Zedek, just peace. Is a king of Salem. How, how many real true kings of peace do we have? One. So there's no great mystery to it. There's only, have you ever known any earthly king that says, well, eternal peace? I don't think so. You know why? They kick the bucket and they're gone and stuff goes in a handbasket. Okay? But we've got one that's not going to die. Okay. He died once for us in the flesh, but he's king of kings and lord of lords. He's eternal and uh, forever. To take your case, he will never leave you, nor will he forsake you. Verse 16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. It doesn't matter what dimension it's in, okay? Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. For God's will to accomplish what? Try to save as many of his children as he could. Now, he's not going to force himself upon anyone. You've got to understand. Well, well, I heard he's heard that door knocking. He's not a beggar, friend. When he knocks on your door, you better know who's knocking, and you better see who's there, and you better let him in. Okay? Do it according to his word. All right? Verse 17. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Now, you want to talk about power, get a hold of that, hang on to it, think about it, meditate on it. 18. And he is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, and in all things he might have the preeminence. You know, that very scripture, do you know what it's saying? 
That's where he explained in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, which beginning at verse 13, that people make the rapture doctrine out of, okay? What does it actually say? If you were to read it immediately following this, what it says is, if, if you know that Jesus, when he rose from the dead, went to the Father, then you know that all the rest of the dead have risen also, and are with him in paradise. And someday we who are even alive in your name at the last trump will be changed and meet him in the air, and the word air in the Greek is breath of life body, meaning spiritual body. So really what it is instead of rapture doctrine is where are the dead? They're with him. To be absent from this body, present with the Lord. Okay. He was the first. And he has the power and what did he do immediately? Well, what about all those people that died before he was born? The only begotten son. They didn't have salvation. He took it to them. Okay. You can read about it in First Peter chapter 3, verse 18 and 19, where he went to the captives and preached to them. And in chapter 4, it will tell you many of those prisoners found freedom. Why? They accepted him. God is always fair to all of his children. Okay. So he was the first. Verse 19. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. You don't have to look anywhere else. Okay. Verse 20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. He plays both bases, friend. Stop and think about that. Whether it's in earth or whether it's in heaven. Well, well how can he do that? Because he's in heaven now. And he's in earth now. He's sitting on the right hand of God, on the very throne of God. Emmanuel, God with us also. Okay. And I'm talking power now to stabilize yourself. In knowing when you are in him, you become a, a person that our Father likes to utilize, likes to bless, likes to receive the love from his children, likes to use them because he can trust them. Okay, turn, turn with me to uh, Hebrews chapter 1. Just a few books ahead from where you are there. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. Hebrews was a letter written by Paul also, though, although it was written to the Heber, he, Heber, Hebrews, which simply is a term, a word that means they cross the river. They cross the river Euphrates. Okay. But he knew that they had the knowledge of the Torah. So he could speak in a little different level. And that throws many students off thinking Paul didn't write this. It's a little different. Not who he wrote it to that makes it a little different. That's simple. Chapter 1, verse 1. God, who at sundry times, many times, and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. I mean, he used old Isaiah, Jeremiah, he used the twelve prophets, the minors, the, and uh, all of them to bring us message to that in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. He was with him. Um, verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory, there's the die again, okay, the cast, the exact image, and the express image of his person. You couldn't tell the difference. And upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged out sin, where did he do that? At the cross, of course. Set down on the right hand of the majesty on high. 
verse 4, being made so much better than the angels as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. How long is he going to sit at the right hand of God? Until all of the enemies are made his footstool. Well, now, wait a minute. I would think he would come back down here and kind of uh, uh, get things squared away here, whereby uh, maybe he'd take care of those enemies. Well, what do you think he's got you for? What do you think you're supposed to do? You think he just wants to look at you? He has people on earth to do his work. And now, well, they're men of me. No, just, you know, we're a lo pretty large body. Overall, I'm not talking about this shepherd's chapel. I'm talking about people that follow Christ that have been hit by that guy all over the world. We get it done. We don't give up ground. We take ground. Okay? And um, here's the enemies. If you're willing to serve, he'll back you up. And when the false one appears as fierce Messiah, he's even going to back you up to the point that it won't be you talking, but God himself to you, through the Holy Spirit. And we're going to take care of the enemies. We're given that power and that authority. So you want to realize um, you're important. Now, I don't want to have to take a needle and, blow, you know, let the air out here or anything. That's just common. That's natural. Good must always combat evil. That's just the way it is, and that's the way God made us, okay? Quite frankly, we can't help ourselves. I guarantee you, we can't help us. I doubt that there's a person in this room that hasn't already kind of went against God's will when he said, I don't want you premeditating what you're going to say to Satan when you deliver that. I'd lay odds that there's not a person in this room that hasn't said, I know what I'd like to tell him. So, but he's in control. He's going to stay there. All right? Now, um, Okay, verse 5. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son? He didn't. And uh, again, this day have I begotten thee, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me the son. And mind, he was the only begotten. When God said, Let us make man in our image, plural, only one could look like him because he is one God. But angels are simply, what does the word angel mean? It means, me excuse me, messenger. And, you know, one of them, God sent back to Daniel. And boy, when Daniel saw that angel, he fell down and started working. He said, hey, get up from there. I, I'm a fellow servant just like you. Get up. You know, God just sent me down here to give you a little word. Okay. So, um, keep things in perspective, all right? Keep things in perspective. There's a big difference between he that was made in the perfect image of God and you, okay, naturally. So, and again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he said, and let all the angels of God worship him. And they did. They rejoiced. Why? Messiah was on earth. He was born. To that virgin, just as it was written in the Old Testament, seven, and the angels, and uh, of the angels, he says, Who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire? God said, Christ would say in another place, I come to this earth to bring a fire, not necessarily peace. In other places, he said, a sword, not necessarily peace. And it will turn family against family. But how blessed I will feel if I find that fire already kindled. Stand it, my friend. Stand that spirit in your heart, in your mind, and make a difference. Okay? Verse 8. You know, I've heard many people have it in their mind that fire is harmful and hurtful and everything. Don't forget it also purifies. And that's what's meant here. Okay? It purifies. But unto the Son, he saith, Thy throne, what did he say to the Son? Listen to these words. Thy throne, O God, 
is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. It's always right and it's always just. That's how you can tell a real person is God. Uh, though you're not going to find a human that's absolutely perfect, they're going, they're going to be, they're going to try at least to do everything right, fair. Uh, verse 9. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. That's to say lies and falsehood. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And praise God he did. He was uh, our Father cut the way, did the cross for my own repentance. You're a free person. That's how much he loves you. And thou, verse 10, and thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands. You made them. You made them. They shall perish. They're going to pass away. Okay, this not the terra firma, the, I'll say it in Hebrew, the rex, but, but the, this earth age, government, they're going to pass away. Uh, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as death of garment. This earth age is going to wax old. It's going to play out. But God's word never changes. And the world that is coming is eternal. And what world is it? It's the same one rejuvenated as it's written in Revelation 21, verse 1, verse 12. And as a vesture should, uh, shall fold them up, shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed, that thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. You're going to change in the twinkle of an eye at the seventh trunk. We're going into that dispensation where God is no longer invisible. This is why it's written in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50, that flesh cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Why? It's in the wrong dimension. Okay, you got it? Verse 13. But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Um, and um, verse 14. That's Psalms 110, verse 1, in case you don't know. You read the whole Psalms 110, I think it's got six or eight verses. It would be good for you to read it to home study. 14. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? I don't know. Are you? The answer is yes. God can use you. It doesn't mean you're supposed to make some big splash. None of us are supposed to. Just do his word, all right? Uh, turn on over to Hebrews chapter 2 while we're right here. And let's pick it up if we may. And about verse 9. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels when he was in the flesh. Now, you got it. For the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Only when he tasted death, he trumped it. He beat it. He overcame it. He destroyed death, or will ultimately. <clears throat> you might say it already is, because... Only your flesh will see death. Your spiritual body steps right into the eternity with him. All right? Um, and verse 10. For it became him, for whom all are all things, by whom are all things, and bringing many sons into his glory, bring salvation to make the captain of their salvation perfect. There's that exact image again, perfect, through suffering. Beloved, it was necessary that he suffered to show you how to cut it. Think about that. The life just gets so teaches. Well, ding up on it, okay? Don't, don't let it get you down. 
usually um, it is your negative uh, fear or fear of the negativity that is going to get you in trouble anyway. It's called worry, just to simplify. Hey, I'm going to tell you something. You want to know a big secret? Worry never saves anybody. All worry won't add one second to your life. If you, instead of worrying, if you will spend that time being constructive to fix whatever is broke, you know, and pray about it and go for it, okay? You may fall flat on your face, but God will love you for having tried anyway. You think of another way, pray about it, and say, Lord, I'm not a quitter. I'm hanging tough. I'm still here. And pretty soon he's got to say, wow. That's my boy. That's my girl. I am so proud of him. What do you think of them, Satan? And Satan's probably going to say, I can take them. No problem. <laughs> well, don't let him. Okay. And, of course, I'm referencing what happened to Job. That's exactly what it was. 11. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Do you know something? He's not ashamed of you. He's not ashamed to call you brother or sister. Brother and family. It's great. Saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church while I sing praise unto thee. Do you know what that's quoting? Psalms 22, verse 23, where he was hanging on the cross, written a thousand years before it come to pass. Man can't do that. God can. Verse 13, and again... I will put my trust in him, and again, behold, I am the children which God hath given me. And he was quoting scripture there, 14, For as much then, as the children are partakers of the flesh, you are because you're here, beloved. I mean, if you pinch yourself, it's going to hurt. Why? You're in the flesh. Now, flesh and blood. He also himself, likewise, took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. He died on that cross. He was placed in a flesh body so that as the righteous God Almighty, when the sons of Cain were crying, Crucify him! He was God on that cross. Emmanuel, God with us. And he now has the right when the lake of fire is opened in Revelation chapter 20 to say, Son, you did it to me, now march. And he's going in, in that lake of fire, which simply, he doesn't burn forever and ever. His smoke goes up forever and ever, okay? Nice thought, isn't it? Well, uh, verse 15, And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Don't be put in bonds, friend. Okay? You're a free soul. God has given you the right to live in, in, uh, in these flesh bodies. And I'll say you Americans, you know, on television I have to say, in this nation, we're especially blessed. Okay? Because you're free. You don't have to go down here to the city hall to get a pass to go to Kansas City. Go on to Kansas City. You just take off. Okay? And, and that's it. And that's a lot to be thankful for, my friend. I've been serving in the military. I've been in a lot of places where that doesn't work. Okay? For the pe people. Okay? It just doesn't. He set us free. And anytime someone preaches a religion to you that puts you in bondage, Rebuke it. Because many churches like to hold people by bond. I'm not judging them. But anytime someone teaches you a Christ that doesn't set you free, for the truth always will, you're in the wrong place. Verse 16. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, could have supernatural, uh, divine. But he took on him the seed of Abraham. 17. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, like flesh, to show you he could cut it. 
that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. He was tempted of Satan in the wilderness forty days and forty nights. And he came through shining to show you that you, he didn't eat for forty days and he still can't save you. Don't let Satan get out of your hide. Order him out of your life. And do it with vigor. Okay? Don't put up with it. Don't let him move your family around. You don't have to. Christ came to this earth to be born in the flesh to show us how to cut it. See that you, when that cast touches you, um, uh, become like that father. Okay? So, the almonds never fall too far from the tree. So be like your father when that cast hits you, okay? And um, verse, um, verse let's, let's finish, take 18 for the fifth completion. For in that he himself had suffered being tempted, he is able to secure them that are tempted. Secure, that's a legal guarantee, friend. It's not just idle words. He can secure you. That's, that's uh, if you want to. I was just talking about setting you free. He can put an anchor uh, to your britches and make, and make sure you make it. If you look at his example and get out there and hook it, I mean get it on with faith, knowing you're a child of God. He wasn't too good to be born in the flesh. To show you how to do it. So don't be, don't be afraid to look at him and take the example, all right, and get after it, okay? Get at, take names, kick dragon, all right? Get tough with them if you have to. But always be kissy kissy, you know, if it'll get it done. If it don't, you know, I'm talking about doing what's right now, not, not making trouble for anybody. You might say, well, my neighbor is a terrible sinner. Do you think I should go over there and straighten him out? No. Nope. I mean, don't be nosy. You know, he might say, why don't you mind your own business? If your neighbor, being a big sinner, though, should come to you and say, well, why is it? I'll use an example. Someone came to my house one time at Christmas and said, I don't understand it. Your whole family's been together here for two days. It might have been Thanksgiving, I don't know, sometime. And he's a bed in one fight. And I was okay. <laughs> like, what? what? What in the world are you talking about? We're a family, you know? If, uh, if we're going to do our fighting, we're going to get out behind the bar. <laughs> Private, we don't fight. I'm, I, you know, we, you talk things out, you know? But, um... <laughs> I found out there his family does fight, and I ain't saying nothing else about this. Anyway, God set the way and shows us how to do it, okay? How to get it done. Turn on with me to chapter 5. We're going to wind this down here, but I, this, this is really important now, so really stay uh, vivacious for me here in your mind. Keep your mind sharp. Keep it working here. This is, this is important. Chapter 5, and let's see verse 6. And he said, we're still uh, concerning Christ. And he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. That's Psalms 110, verse 4. Now, again, it's important that you know what the word Melchizedek means. It means King of Peace. There's only one, and that's King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's Jesus Christ. Hey, don't let it stretch your mind. He was he was with God when everything was made. So don't think that initially he showed up when Abraham was already born. That was several many years down the road. Got it? Stay with me. Seven. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared. Um, uh, eight, and though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. He did it exactly as God had instructed him to. Speaking of the cross, nine. 
And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. That do what? There's a condition there. That obey him. At least try. You're going to slip up, but all you have to do is repent. You paid the price, and he'll say, it's okay. It's okay. I'm with you. Let's get it together now, and let's hit it again. All right? Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. Now, if you take this message to much of the world, that, this is going to be the case. They're not going to know what you're talking about. They don't know about the first earth age. And, uh, and that's, uh, does that make them all sinners? No. That's just the way it is. Twelve for when, for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teacher again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk, and not of strong meat. In other words, if you go to church for thirty years and all you do is sit on the front row and hear salvation preach, where was the teaching of the word of God? Where's the rest of the letter? Where's the debt? How do you know what you're supposed to do? They didn't. Okay? That's what he's saying. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Some of them not even potty trained yet. Okay? But strong meat belongs to them that are of full age. That means mature, using common sense, even those who by reason of youth have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Are your senses exercised? That means your mind. If you use your mind, you should. Always look ahead. Look down the road. Is trouble coming? Then let's be sure. It may be trouble that we want. If it is, then go through it. Okay? Take care of it. Take care of business. Uh, nobody's going to take care of your business but you. Okay? The Lord will help you, but you got to you got to stand up with the staff and say this. Is the way it is. I've figured it out. Put your mind to it and uh, stay strong in the Word of God. Okay? Chapter um, 7. We're going to come, this will be our last place. Verse 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, peace, priest of the Most High God, he met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. You can understand now why Jesus said to those that were Kenites, the sons of Satan in John chapter 8, when he said, Before Abraham was, I am. I have seen Abraham. And this is it. To whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem which is king of peace. Three, without father, here on earth, you understand. Without mother, here on earth. Without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Made to look exactly like the Son of God. Why? Because it was the Son of God. When he was struck with that die, they made him look exactly like Almighty God. Okay? That's King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of his spoils. And verily, they that are the sons of Levi. Now, who's Levi? There's a reason we're here now. Sharpen up for me. They were the priest line. The sons of Levi who received the office of the priesthood had a commandment to take tithes of people according to the law and is of their children through though they came out of the loins of Abraham. Six, but he whose descent, his pedigree, is not counted from them, received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promise. I mean, he wasn't, he wasn't born in the Levitical priesthood. He didn't have the, I mean, he was the son of God. Melchizedek, that is. Seven. And without eat, without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the, of the better. Abraham knew. Okay. He discerned. And 
here men that die receive tithes. But there he receiveth them, of whom it is written that he liveth. He never dies. Okay. We have one priest, and that's Christ. And as I may say, Levi also who received tithes, paid tithes to Abraham, in Abraham rather, you know why he was in the loins, okay? For he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Eleven, if therefore perfection, is to say salvation, were by the Levitical priesthood, now we're getting down to the nitty gritty here. Let, let me ask you a question. What tribe was Christ from? He wasn't, well, they didn't say he was from Levi. He said he was from the tribe of Judah. I just want to, oh, wake your mind up a little bit here. And therefore, perfection and salvation were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law. What further need was there that another priest, Christ, should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. That is, that you to open your mind up and see how that die was cast, okay? For he of whom these things are spoken pertain us to another tribe, of which no man gave attendance at the altar, the tribe of Judah. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning the priesthood, and it is yet far more evident for that after the similitude, the likeness of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest who is made not after the law of, of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. For he testifies, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. How did this come to pass? You see, the beauty is God didn't break his own rules. Christ was. Because people do not study the simplicity. All of you know that Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, were cousins. Now, how do you get to be cousins? That means that one of, your, one of the other of your parents is a brother or a sister. Well, in Mary's case, Elizabeth's mother and Mary's mother were both sisters. And Mary uh, and uh, Elizabeth's genealogy is given as a pure daughter of Aaron in Luke chapter 1. She was not of the tribe of Judah. Neither was Mary's mother. But the genealogy of Mary, given in Luke 3, is of Mary's father. Okay. And the Mary's father was of Judah. So Mary was half Levite and half of Judah. Therefore, that guy that was cast brought together both the priest and the king line, and he is now all in all, after the order of Melchizedek forever. It simplified the whole thing. I hope it doesn't sound like I'm mishmashing. I hope that came through. You, you know what cousins are, and you know where it's recorded in Luke chapter 1. It's real easy. But we see this priesthood as it is solved, that Christ became in the likeness of the Father. And God, inasmuch as He is Father of all, has brought forth this beautiful thing to bring salvation to you, to me, to the world that will obey, that will listen, that will believe. He's there for you all the time. He will never leave you, nor will He forsake you. It is difficult sometimes for people to see through Emmanuel, but it's very important that you do. I hope this has been a blessing. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the written word. Thank you, Father, for the simplicity. 
in which Melchizedek, in which Christ himself teaches, that brings that truth to the front and assures and features our salvation. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.